Okay, uh, I'm Vince Teckler. I think uh, most of you uh, saw me this morning. I've been the CEO of Avast here in Prague for about two years. I have about 30 years in the industry, which I think makes me more work experience than most okay. of you have lived. Um, I am American. Uh, I haven't lived in the U.S. though for about 10 years. Uh, before Prague, I lived in Asia for about seven years. I used to run Semantics uh, Asia and Japan business. And then after that, I ran uh, Semantics uh, Worldwide Consumer Sales. I was the number two in uh, Semantic Consumer for many years. So if you have either loved or hated Norton, I'm one of the ones to blame for that. Uh, it's great uh, being here in uh, Prague, though. This the level of innovation and the ability to do things so uh, so quickly and so efficiently compared to what I was used to out of the U.S. and out of Asia uh, is amazing. So I'm sure we get into the, a little bit of that with questions and answers. Uh, my career started I said, about 30 years ago uh, as a programmer. Uh, I spent uh, many, many years programming and then I uh, slowly moved onto the business side of the equation and these, Dells, these days I'd have a very hard time telling, uh, being able to do anything at all programming wise other than trying to uh, keep my machines running. So thank you for coming, looks very good and I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I just hope that they they are in the right room that they wanted to come to. But uh, um, my name is Andre Bartosz. Uh, I'm Czech. I'm here at home, so I don't have to explain why I'm here. Um, I'm a venture capitalist. Uh, I currently am a partner of a company called Credo Ventures. Um, just three weeks ago, we announced uh, a new fund focused on technology startups. So if you have a great technology project, if you have a great startup, I'm here and I have money for you. Um, a little bit of, on, on my background, I, I started as a, as a University of Economics student and entrepreneur. I started my own, uh, my first company in 1996 uh, when I was in my third year of, uh, of University of Economics because I was bored with the studies. And I, I had started about seven companies in total in, in, the, in the years 96 through 2001. Um, none of them ever hit it big because I never had the smart idea. I never had the uh, world-changing, revolutionary idea for a product or a solution. Um, so I turned consultant. That's, uh, that's usually what happens. So I started consulting other entrepreneurs, um, some of which actually had a great idea. And after I made some money on consulting, I turned VC. First, I, I turned angel investor. I, I invested into a couple of companies that I usually that I consulted to, and um, and th then later on in 2004 I became a VC. So in the last six years, um, my job is to screen business plans and eventually give money to the best to the best entrepreneurs and to, to the best projects that I, that I see. Um, and actually, my job is to go to coffees and talk to a lot of people and talk at conferences. Thanks, Don, for inviting me. Excellent. Vince, let's, go ahead. Uh, Vince, let's start with you. If you could tell us the Avast story, because it's a story that started in Czechoslovakia over 20 years ago and is now close to being a public company. So if you could walk us through uh, that story. Sure, be glad to. Uh, obviously, I wasn't around at the, uh, at the start of it, so I will probably uh, start a lot of new urban myth here. Uh, the company uh, actually goes back to uh, 1988 and uh, our two founders who by the way are still involved in the company and who are still by far the uh, majority shareholders. Uh, one of them uh, was actually had graduated from Charles University with a doctorate in nuclear physics. 
But beings that he refused to join the Communist Party, there were not any jobs available for him in nuclear physics. Uh, the other uh, gentleman was working at one of the uh, state computer labs, university computer labs. He was actually a uh, chemist. And uh, one day on one of their brand new IBM PCs they'd managed to get, they saw a virus. Uh, you know, in 1988, had never seen one before. So they decided to write a little utility to, uh, to wipe it out. Uh, they did, and then they thought, hey, it'd be great if we could somehow uh, you know, make this available to others. So uh, things were being liberalized a little bit, and cooperatives were allowed. So they and a, a number of their colleagues decided to set up a, a cooperative to further develop the product and to, and to uh, distribute it. And they did that, and then of course uh, communism fell. They were able to reform it as a company in 1991, uh, on April Fool's Day actually in 1991. Um, and uh, had a nice business going for a number of years, mainly serving uh, the local market, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland a little bit. And then they had uh, actually an inquiry from McAfee. Uh, McAfee had heard of this little product, little company. McAfee's product was terrible at the time, so McAfee tried to buy the company. Uh, and they, uh, they kept saying no. They finally, though, licensed the engine to McAfee. So for a little bit of time in the 1990s, McAfee was actually a vast. That's probably something you did not know. Um, then McAfee eventually found a company to buy and they dropped the use of a vast and uh, this big money inflow that had come into the company suddenly disappeared and it, uh, you know, created problems. You know, what do we do? Uh, then the Czech Republic joined the EU, which would normally be a good thing. However, what it also meant was that a lot of the Czech companies got bought up by multinationals who had their own preferred security solution, which was not a vast. Also, it brought Semantic and McAfee into the uh, domestic marketplace, who frankly had better products and, and dramatically cut their prices. So Avast was faced with its domestic market drying up. Uh, of course, there's another AV company in the country called AVG, and uh, AVG had had similar problems, and they had uh, decided themselves to, hey, let's try distributing free on the Internet. So the Avast guys basically copied that. Don't any reporters don't put that in the press. <laughs> uh, but it was a great idea uh, to put out a very good free product, have uh, something that has some differences that people can upgrade to if they want. So they started that in 2004, 2005. And remember, our founders are um, uh, probably the biggest geek in here. Our founders are geekier than you. Uh, so they did not believe in selling anything. They did not believe in marketing anything. Uh, that's the dirty stuff. Uh, so what they really believed in was that high-quality product would attract users. And if you attracted enough users, they would start recommending it to others. Uh, I'm sure if you saw it as a business plan, you would say, no way. Um. Actually, <laughs> I, I will take this as a question because I actually <laughs> I, I met uh, Eduard and Pavel uh -huh. in probably like early 2000, and I was I was I was there when they actually faced the problems, and it was a it was a serious problem. I mean, Avast, or actually Alwell Software oh. at that time was on the verge of, you know, going out of business because they didn't know how to monetize. And, you know, at that time, I, I cannot say I would have invested or I wouldn't have <laughs> invested. Of course, I can tell you that I would have invested for sure. But there's one thing about, about venture capital that is that it's, that it's really a lot about investing in people. And those two guys, I, I knew it in 2000 that they were bright and they were geeks, which is good for a technology company. So I might have, you know. Well, you missed your chance. <laughs> you could so, be retired on the beach now. Um. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> so, so it went that way. And... Um, uh, lo and behold, the model worked, and they slowly built up a loyal base of those 
Um, you know, what we like to say is in every, in every group of family or friends is one or two people who provide computer support to everyone else. And in this room, I'm sure it's you who provide computer support to all your family and friends. And those people found out about Avast around the world and started recommending it to their mothers, their brothers, their girlfriends, their boyfriends, such that, you know, the distribution took off without any, uh, any need to do any marketing. Uh, then several years ago, they thought, hey, um, to really be successful, we need to get into the corporate space. Uh, so they decided to talk to VCs to try to get some money to invest in the corporate space. And lo and behold, uh, they met a VC who uh, told them, you don't want to go into the corporate space. Uh, consumers are a lot more profitable. You know it very well. Why would you want to do something else? They said, but what you really need is a CEO. Uh, <laughs> so they went off and uh, decided to search for a CEO. Uh, they found someone they really liked, who was not me. Uh, but he was actually retired in Switzerland, uh, and his wife would not let him move to Prague. Uh, he was my old boss, actually. And uh, he said, hey, uh, I can't take it, but uh, Vince here is leaving Semantic. Why don't you talk to him? He'd do great. So they, uh, they brought me on board about uh, two years ago to really take that company to the next step. Uh, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I think you know that we recently raised uh, $100 million from Summit Partners. Summit is one of the uh, biggest uh, American uh, late-stage investors. Uh, but ours is kind of an unusual story in that um, it's a lot easier to get funding when you don't need funding. Uh, the company itself is extraordinarily profitable. Uh, free software distribution is a tremendously profitable way of running a business. Uh, the profit margins are just far beyond what you could imagine. But what we wanted Summit Partners on board for, it wasn't the cash, it was to take that next step. Uh, we are um, you know, a Czech company. All of our people are here in Prague. We don't have offices anywhere else in the world. Uh, our management team, with the, my ex, uh, with the exception of me, is uh, all Czech. But our number one market is the U.S., and our number two is France. Uh, the Czech Republic is only 3% of our business. All of the old kind of behind the Iron Curtain countries is lucky if it's 10% of our business. But the uh, investors, or if we try to do uh, an IPO, yeah, having a label of a Czech company, an Eastern European company, it's, it's a difficult thing to get past. So if you get on board, in our case, a, a very name brand investor, it gives us a lot of credibility in the market. Because if we ever do, do decide to go public, uh, I'm sure the people on the Prague Exchange won't like to hear it, but they've heard it many times. Uh, we would not go public in Prague uh, because you can't get the kind of valuations. So a public listing for us is more of an American listing or a UK listing or a Dutch listing. And that's a lot more difficult to do for a little company here in Prague. So a main reason we brought an investor on board was really to give us some credibility and to help us with that whole process of how we end up going public. Now, because our business is basically doubling every year, our free users are just increasing dramatically, and our profit margins are astronomical, we set the terms. Uh, so it wasn't like we had to go off and um, you know pitch ourselves to investors. They were uh, knocking on our door, and many of them regretting that they had turned down chances four or five years ago to buy a part of the company. So we're a little unusual story there. It's a, it's a nice situation to be in. Um, okay, but it's so going to work out well. That's, that's a fascinating story, but that's not the typical story. Now, that's not typically the way companies get started. Uh, Andre, can you give us an example of a more typical scenario or either one you've seen or one you've invested in? Well, first of all, a typical scenario I haven't invested in because the typical scenario of a company here is that it gets started, it does not get funding, either because they don't look for an investor or, or they fail looking for an investor. So they bootstrap and they create a, a solid, uh, solid business. Um, someone would call it lifestyle business. 
um, in terms of it never hits big, it never gets IPO'd, but, uh, but you can live out of it. So a, a typical scenario is not what I've invested in. What I can give you is, um, is probably one example that goes in contrast to what Vince has, uh, has explained, which is a story of a company called All Peers. It's a Czech company. I, I, I don't know if you've heard about them, but some of them might. Um, it's, a, it's a technology company that was founded, I believe, in 2005 or 6. They, um, it, it, they developed, um, I believe it was a peer-to-peer -peer sharing, file sharing add-on to Mozilla or Firefox or something like that. It was a really technolo sophisticated technology company. They, one of the first things they did was they wrote a business plan. They went out to find investors and they actually did find investors from Western Europe, two funds of great names, great brands, Index Ventures and, uh, and Mangrove. They, those two funds invested, I think something something around 1 million euros. I think it was never disclosed. And this company spent the money on development. Uh, it took them a year, which is slow enough, I think. And they went bankrupt a year after they got funding. And what it should tell us is that venture capital is not a guarantee for your success. And as you can see, Avast Founders built a uh, great company which actually is on a global map on bootstrapping on you know creativity how to survive the bad times on introducing you know what at that time was pretty innovative business model although they copied it but at that time it was not a proven model uh, whereas a company who goes out to seek for an investor they succeed finding an investor but still they fail at the end. So even though I'm a VC and I want you to want venture capital, you have to remember that it's not a guarantee for your success. Okay. okay, so I've done this session in six different countries. This is the sixth one. And I've asked the audience some questions to get a feel for where you are. So I'd like to ask you, how many of you work for a company that is five years old or less? So a startup or a small company that's only been around for five years, how many? So about 20%. That's good. That's, that's actually very, very good. I asked the same question in Germany, and it was about, about the same, about 20%. So if I asked that question in the United States, it's the other way around. 80% of the people work for small companies that are five years or less, and 20% work for big companies. So that's my next question. Um, how many of you have worked in the same job for the same company for five years or more? Raise your hands. Wow. Wow. That is amazing. In Germany, 60 to 70 percent of the people stay in the same job with the same company for more than five years. So you tend to move around a lot, move from company to company, right? That's more American. That's what we do. We change companies every year or two or three different companies. Yeah, it's a good thing to do. Uh, how many of you want to start a company at some point? You, you want to start something new. Okay, you're in the right place. This is the place to learn how to do that. Okay, uh, th th that's truly amazing. Um, so it's very common in the US and I think everywhere for an engineer to have an idea and work on it at night and weekends and start to get it going and then they say, okay, I need some money, I need some more people. So what do you look for when an entrepreneur comes to you with an idea that they've been working on nights and weekends? What do you need to see to write a check? 
Hmm. Well, first of all, the most generic or most general answer is I need to see something that solves a problem in the market. And this is something that, that you hear a lot at events like this um, about startups and entrepreneurship. But I still don't see it enough in practice. Um, still, you know, most of the entrepreneurs that come to me um, looking for money um, don't actually have the answer for the question, what need does your product solve? They usually explaining explain me about how greatly, you know, round or blue or, you know, the crazy people, Java, their product is. But I don't care too much, plus I don't understand it too much. What, what I care about is how much people need what you want to develop or what you want to bring to the market and how big the problem actually in the market is. Because I need to see that there is a problem to be solved, and I need to see that there's not too much competition who's already solving the problem effectively. So that's, that's sort of the first thing. And second that I would, that I would, um, that I would say is I would love to see that the entrepreneur did everything he could before going out to the investor. Very, what I mean by that is very often I see entrepreneurs who come to me with the idea only. And they're like, you know, I was thinking, um, how about, you know, doing a social network for, you know, geeks? What, that, that is cool, right? And I'm like, hmm, okay, did you ask any of the geeks that you know if they actually need something like that? Why would they need it? I haven't told a single, single soul. I mean, what if they stole it? You know, <laughs> this is my idea, you know. And I, I was at a conference last week in Bucharest and there was a guy who who sold his company to Adobe uh, recently. And he explained his story to the audience. And one of the, one of the things that I loved about the presentation was he explained how in the initial phase of his startup, without he had the product, he actually printed out a box of the product that he had in mind. And he brought it to the supermarket, or actually to the store where they sell software and he put it on the shelf and he spent like a week i mean seven times a day not that he slept in the store but almost looking at the potential customer's reaction he did a you know market test and when somebody stopped by the product he asked him what made him stop what what was the feature that he liked about the box, really? There was no software. He didn't let anybody buy, you know? That would be, that would be the coolest thing. So what I need to see is, you know, <laughs> buying a box for 20 bucks. That's a good business, actually. <laughs> there might be a niche. So what I need to see is that the entrepreneur has done everything that he could before going to the investor in terms of, you know, thinking about the customers, actually checking the market, asking around, maybe developing some kind of a, you know, prototype or little prototype, something that he could do without the money. You know, take his time. So a lot of times, um, engineers who are working at night and weekends, uh, they develop the idea, they get a couple of their friends who say, yeah, this is a great idea, I want to do this too but they're all still working at their employers, their big companies. And they don't want to leave and do this idea until they get a check from you. That never happens, right? It, it, people try to do this in the US too, and it never happens, right? You have to, because the venture capitalist says, if you don't believe in the idea enough to quit your job and do it full time, 
why do you expect me to give you money to do it? When I see that you've quit your job and you're totally focused on getting this done and you can convince four or five other people to quit their job and come with you, then I'll write a check. Do, is that a requirement for you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the, the thing is, um, I don't have anything against uh, the entrepreneurs to be or the geeks or the developers uh, working on their product or their project on the weekends or on the nights. That's okay. But that's the phase pre-investment. And once you come to the investor, you have to be so committed that, that, that you're either already out of your old job or you know, ready to quit your job. Um, what, uh, and you, you can't be just prepared to quit your job only if the VC gives you money. It's like almost like a blackmail. You know, the entrepreneur comes to me and says, you know, I only quit my job if you give me the money. You know, it's your call. You know, never happens. Never happens. Um, the VC never can be the only one taking the risk, right? So do what, what you need to do on the weekends and on the nights, but once you address the investor, you have to be fully committed. Okay, so we're going to take questions from the audience. Raise your hand if you have a question, and I will bring you the mic. Okay, right here. Thanks. Uh, uh, I have to ask, I have a small company which just established it a uh, few weeks ago, but uh, we have products for almost a year. So I'd like to ask... Uh, we are just a small company, only a few people. It's generating some money. So we are like, uh, okay with this. So what you can provide us, like why we should ask investor? Yeah, we are not in big need like some to get some money. Yeah? We, we are just uh, growing slowly. So it's fine. So what you can provide us? You can provide us only money or also you can help us uh, with established company in the US or uh, help us with marketing or how is it working? Again, generally, um, I, I believe the VC is there to help you to achieve your dream. So, number one, you have to have a dream. If you don't have a dream, then we're probably not the right, uh, the right ones to ask money from. If your company is generating money, if your company is okay, does not need cash, I, I wouldn't go to a VC because VC usually takes a big chunk of your of your company and if you don't need us um probably don't do it i i think vc should really be for the ones who who know what great thing they could do and they don't have money for it and banks don't give them the money so that's that's a vc play but, you know, um, a profitable business which does not have any dreams, but just want to, you know, continue, we're not the right ones. We have dreams, but, like, uh, we think we can do them by ourselves, like, without, without uh, some external money coming now. Beautiful. If you can do it yourself, don't come to us, because we will take a huge chunk of your company. So, why am I asking, uh, so, what's, what's our, like, uh, which possibilities uh, it can give us. Like, uh, for example, how much uh, money you can invest through some startup company. Let's say it's company with uh, free employees, uh, have some applications, uh, they generate some money. How, how much you can invest? Like, it's like <laughs> one million, uh, just, just <laughs> to have go, just 742,000 euros. <laughs> <laughs> and I want 43%. It's like one million, Okay. VCs in the U.S. typically invest um, anything north of two, three million dollars, and they go up to probably I don't know thirty, forty. Then it's called private equity, right? Um, in Europe, venture capital typically starts at one million euros and goes up to three, maybe four million euros. We um, try to be even lower in the, in the value chain. We 
try to inv we want to invest 250,000 euros up to 2 million. So that's sort of what we look for. Um, but um, what, I, um, what, I, <laughs> what I hate to hear from the entrepreneurs is, um, is the question, how much will you invest? Because we want to invest what you need, sure. right? We don't want to push you more money or you know, convince you that you need less money. We want to invest exactly the amount you, you need. I think right. Vince answered and that question earlier, actually. Vince's company, Avas, didn't need the money either. But you take the money because the VC can provide more exposure for you, introduce you to more markets, get you into a public market. Right, Vince? I mean, you didn't need uh, the money. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think if you go to an investor and ask, what can you do for me, they're going to politely or maybe impolitely give you the give you the uh, middle finger. Um, <laughs> you need to be telling the investor why you want them on board and how you're going to do better with them on board. Uh, if it's the other way around, then it means that um, you don't have the, um, uh, the vision for what, for what they want. We have VCs, another question out here. I'm, I'm sorry, regarding the volume, VCs are good for two things, generally. Not all VCs, and I'm not saying that I am the one, but generally, VCs are good for two things. One is contacts. Because they drink so much coffee and because they meet so many people, and because they're, they spend way too much time at conferences, they know a lot of people, so they can do introductions. Second thing, their job, their business is to, in simple words, buy and sell companies. So if you, if you're, if you aim to do a, an exit in the future, as you know, Avaz does, a VC might be very helpful in the process and actually in, you know, pushing the valuation up, you know, investors, strategic investors even are used to the fact, and it's a fact, that VC-backed companies have higher valuation. You know, it's a bit unfair. On the other hand, it has some real-life, you know, basis. Like, VCs always take care that the company does everything right, has corporate governance working, has all the contracts in place and stuff like that. And that's one of the things that the, the investors in the future pay for the the premium. Okay, you know. we have another question here. All right, uh, hello. Uh, I have another question, maybe you know, a little bit related to the previous one. I am a co-founder of another small startup, and uh, my question is basically, uh, what amount of revenue or profits uh, do you see as an interesting, let's say, limit for yourself, so that it's no more a lifestyle business, as you said, but something that you'd be inter interested investing in? I, um, I, I can't give you the figure. I can't give you a number because um, that's not the most <laughs> important thing. Truth is that VCs don't usually look for pre-revenue startups that have no revenues, zero. Um, in the US, we do, all the time. In the US, yes. On the other hand, even, even in the US, there's the angel round first and stuff like that. You know? VCs usually want to see some revenue, some customers. And I can't give you a, a, mm. a, a benchmark or a threshold that, um, that sort of activates the interest. Um, it doesn't matter. It, it depends on the type of the business, on the business model, on the stage of development of the product, um, on many things. I think it has more to do with the scale of what it mm. could be, mm -hmm. the scale of the idea, not where it is today. Because in the US, angels and venture capitalists invest in companies before they have any revenue, zero. But the difference between a lifestyle company that is going to be a $10 million company and never any bigger, and a billion dollar company, both start at zero, both have no revenue, but it's how scalable is the idea? How big could it possibly be? And venture capital investors do the math to figure out 
okay, could this company be a $10 million company or a $10 billion company? And they'll put the money in before the revenue is there. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, not not just the business plan, but the market, the, the opportunity. How how big the opportunity is, how you know big the market is, how scalable um, you can get. Um, that's that's yeah. that's what's yeah. mostly in, interesting. I mean, I think you can run a lot of the numbers yourself. Uh, I mean, if you take a look at what you think your business is going to be, what your market opportunity is. And you look at public sector valuations range, you know, if you're on revenue three times, 20 times, 25 times, and, you know, factors on the uh, cash flow and the profitability. And if you're seeing that in three years, four years, you can have a $10 million business that has maybe 20% profit, you're not going to get much of an investment. It's a, very much a, a lifestyle business. So... You're really looking for something, uh, as you said, that really scales either in the consumer space or corporate space. It solves a, a meaningful problem and isn't just what I like to call a solution in search of a problem. Um, or it's some uh, really neat piece of technology that you got a lot of protection around the IP where the, uh, you know, the technology itself is valuable that someone else can use at the core of bringing something to the market. But, you know, if what you're trying to build is kind of a little, uh, I love the lifestyle business, um, it's not really a, a target for uh, investment. You've got to be thinking, um, you know, big. And, and don't get, get us wrong. I mean, lifestyle business is perfectly legitimate way to do business. And it could be, you know, very respectable and, you know, heads down is just not for a VC investor. Correct. And Avast was a lifestyle business for 18, 19 years. It was only several years ago the founders decided, hey, it would be nice to have this as something else that, you know, we want to be big in the world. Uh, so you can run lifestyle for a long time and then change. Okay. Again, raise your hand if you have any questions and I'll come to you. Uh, so you're next. Vince, let me ask you a question. The other way that companies get started is employees leave successful companies. They have ideas inside of a successful company, but the company doesn't want to do it. So they get frustrated and they say, okay, if my company won't do it, then I'm going to leave and start my own company and do it. Do you see that happening uh, in the Czech Republic in general or at Avast? Have, have you seen examples of that? No, I think that's unfortunate, and I think that's a, a great example. In fact, that's how uh, Oracle got a lot of their companies. There were ex-employees who got pissed off that they couldn't do what they wanted to do with an Oracle. They founded their own company, made it successful, and then Ellison bought them back and fired them. Uh, um, uh, but... Um, uh, here, stability seems to be valued. Like, there's a plus and a minus at a vast in that I can't think of a single voluntary turnover uh, resignation we have had in the past years. I mean, that's great for us, but it also means, you know, people are extremely comfortable. And, you know, there's lots of things I'm sure people would like uh, to do or think we should do. But, you know, that's a big step to, uh, to quit and start your own thing. So from, you know, stability viewpoint of a vast, it's great that our, our people stay. Uh, but on the flip side, it, um, uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's bad for the country. Um, I would have a question probably to Andre. Um, what would be an example of company that you have invested in, if you can tell us like an example? Okay, um, I can give you um, an unsuccess story and a success story if you want. Um, the unsuccess, I love unsuccess stories, so that's why I'm always trying to push them. The unsuccess story is my investment from 2007 into a company named Nostromo, is there anybody who has worked with Nostromo? No. Okay. It's a, so, I can, <laughs> so I can say bad things. Um, 
No, actually, I, I wouldn't say bad things about, about the people from the company. It was an investment into a company in mobile content business. And we did it end of 2007, when pretty much all of the analysts predicted huge rises and increases in the market. And they predicted you know, huge sales of you know, ringtones, logos, games, blah, 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 all the personalization stuff on the mobile phones. And Nostromo was in the very high premium um, uh, of, the, of the market because they did branded content. So they bought worldwide licenses for Garfield and they bought licenses for Ninja Turtle, whatever it's called. They had Simpsons. They had a lot of really great brands, which were great for, for the times when the content sold and they were terrible for the times that, that it didn't because they were expensive. So 2008 was the year of disillusion. Um, mobile content went down drastically and also the market changed in a way that mobile carriers pretty much took over most of the business under their control. So to make the long two-year-old, two-year, two-year story short, uh, Nostromo went bankrupt uh, end of 2009 and they burned one point, no, actually one million dollars that we invested. Um, you know, bad luck. Um, on the other hand, we're still in touch with the entrepreneurs and we are actually, I am actually looking at a project that uh, one of the founders of Nostromo now has. And, you know, there's a, there's a certain chance that we will fund um, another business of this guy, which is great. Um, and success story, I don't know, maybe, um, maybe um, you know, the most famous company that I've made an investment in is called Invia, invia.cz. It's, or actually invia dot whatever. It's, uh, it's currently the largest Central European OTA, online travel agency. And um, it's, a, it's a market leader by far. I did this investment in 2008. Um, and it's a, it's a good investment, although there was a crisis and, you know, um, people predicted that the business would go bad. Invis still um, growing, so it's a, it's a good investment. We have another question over here. Um, good evening. Uh, I have a, uh, we have an idea, we have a dream. Uh, we invested some, some money into a project, uh, data marketing research, you, uh, how much it will need to program it, uh, and such things. We we uh, could invest to, to program it. Uh, the problem is that the, it it needs some marketing as well. So so we calculate that it will need, uh, let's say, a million dollars to do it. So we, let's say we need uh, people like you. Uh, what is the what is the best way to find people like you, <laughs> and uh, what what we need uh, to uh, show you the project, and what we need, so what sort of information you will need from us, how we should present it, if we should send it by mail, just or okay. whatever. Okay, what is the best way to find me? Baba, -ba, you just found me. Um, <laughs> What is the best way how to find others? There are not too many others. So let's not spend time with that. Um, <laughs> but there's, uh, there's actually really not too many others. Um, you can take a look at industry association websites where you can find pretty much all the details for other guys. Um, but in this region, 
we're one of the few focusing on, on the early stage of, of companies, um, on the startups. Andre, are there startup incubators here, like university incubators? You know, it depends. Incubators? Okay, Don, it depends on who you ask. If you ask the Minister of Industry and Trade, he would tell you that there are 47 incubators. If you ask me, I'll tell you there's none. So it really depends on your criteria. Mm -hmm. Are there incubators? you know, like we see in the US, no. Are there institutions called incubators and getting EU money? Oh yeah, plenty. Yeah. Is, there, is there anybody from an incubator sitting in an incubator? See? Sorry? Yeah, they sit in the... Um, South Moravian Innovation Center. That's probably the only one that comes close to what, what you know, my definition of an incubator would be. But still, it's, it's, you know, it's low. Mm. It's on the verge. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't know if you've worked with. Uh, not with incubators, but uh, I am seeing more in Central Europe of the um, U.S. Uh, beauty show type things. Uh, you do have red hair in here, although that can be a little dodgy at times. But uh, some of the uh, investors do sponsor uh, fairly big road shows where uh, you, know, you can go in and pitch your idea to uh, a, gr a group of investors. It, it basically comes down to uh, networking. Uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, the, uh, the uh, beauty pitches tend to be in uh, Germany or France, but you know, those are fairly short drive yes. away. But if you start networking and looking at the investors who go to uh, Red Herring or some of the events in the U.S. and some of those events are now starting to appear in, in Central Europe, those are the people that you want to know. And another good one is a, um, a financial advisor. Uh, and there are quite a few here in, in Prague and they're usually much better connected to the uh, CE investors and the local investors and can get you in front of them and can guide you through uh, a business plan, etc. What is absolutely great and what I would recommend to anybody who wants to start up a company or actually has started up a company is enter competitions. And there are a couple of European-wide, like Seedcamp, that are they're there. And there are a couple of sort of... Um, ad hoc, like, you know, at a, at a conference, you enter a, a business plan competition and the jury just looks at them, gives you feedback, um, announce a winner. Any opportunity of something like this is valuable because at the very early stage of, you know, a startup, what the entrepreneur needs probably the most is feedback. And it's honest feedback from people who are not your mother or your employees, but, uh, but from someone who has seen probably hundreds of, or thousands of business plans or startups. Enter startup competitions. Um, there's one local here, which is, actually there are a couple of local here who you can enter. There are a couple of Central European, there are plenty of European-wide go ahead and do it. It's a good investment. You usually have to pay to get to the conference afterwards. It's a good investment. And to your question, what, what, what you should do, I think you should get to the business planning thing. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, just, just so you are sure, I'm not a formalist. And the thing that you aim for is actually not a 60-pager, you know, fat document as such, but it's the business planning process that you have to go through to have the, the answers to the right questions. Like, what is the need in the market that you solve? Who are your customers? Who's your competition? And why are you different or unique or better? You know, those are, so that's why we always keep talking about business plans, but I don't care if you have a document or a PowerPoint or a, or, or a flash movie. The important thing is that it answers the, the right questions. Okay, we have one more question over here. 
Um, thanks. Uh, what do you think about uh, the differences in uh, risk-taking culture between uh, Europe and uh, US? Because I, th I think it's a huge. Uh, I think it's the also. same, pretty much. I don't know. Uh, um, that was a joke. Uh, one thing. Yeah, that I, was a joke. I'm sorry. I will have to. I will have to announce my jokes. I mean, I've been um, U.S., Asia, and uh, Europe, and uh, uh, actually, the reason I left Semantic is I was uh, starting up my own business in uh, Asia, so I was making the same round you all are thinking of, you know, hitting up investors, and uh, then a vast came knocking. Um, I think I think there's no doubt that the uh, U.S. is much more willing to uh, take risks. Uh, that's shown by the show of hands on, you know, how many are um, 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 uh, you know, working for a, a fairly new company. It shows there aren't all that many fairly new companies here compared to the U.S. Um, uh, Asia, I think, outside of, of China, I think is uh, you know quite similar to Europe. It's pretty risk adverse. China is a, a bit of a different story. Uh, so it, it is a little. I think uh, uh, I feel a little strange uh, at times uh, in Europe. It's it's not so much Czech Republic. I think it's uh, emblematic of Europe as a whole. Yeah, I asked the same question came up in Germany. And they are so averse to risk that they don't want to start companies. And I told them, in the US, failure is not a word that we use. Fail we call failure experience. And yeah. you need to have experience in order to you know, go out there and make things happen. Right. So failure is expected, and it's OK. And entrepreneurs typically fail the first time. Uh, as Andre said, the, that ex example he used of the company that failed, he may actually give them money again to start another company yeah. because that's experience. They won't make those mistakes the second time and they'll be more successful. So take risk, push hard. Uh, it's not for everyone, but it's the most amazing thing to start a company and see it grow. So I hope you all have the opportunity one time in your life uh, to start a company. It's, it's an amazing thing. But that risk taking is also something that um, uh, I like to see even inside a company. You, uh, I expect people to fail at things. If you don't fail at things, it means you haven't tried something new. So when you're talking to someone and, uh, you know, like when you're interviewing someone and everything has been a success, uh, that's not good. You don't learn from successes. If all you're doing is succeeding, you're not pushing the envelope. So even if you don't start your own company within your own employer, you should be doing that. Uh, unless, of course, your bosses are so conservative they don't understand that. <laughs> okay, one last and question. Actually, it's, it's about all of us to change this because, you know, the risk, uh, the, the, the fact that we don't take risk is probably at least partially because you know failure is usually punished here you know what what did he do oh he failed you know it's like bad at school kids you know kids if they fail it's a huge problem and i think it's totally okay to fail i mean once twice three times not always for the same reason actually but but, you know, for different reasons, that's okay to fail. And, you know, we should all encourage it, encourage it exactly. Okay, one last question. Hi. Um, as a VC, would you always be looking towards capital growth and an exit strategy? Or will you ever invest to get income and stay with the company for an extended period of time? No, no. VCs always look for the exit. And we actually... You know, this, this is exaggerating, but we don't care about the profits on, on the go, and we usually don't take dividends, um, very rarely. Uh, we look for the exit at the, at the end, and uh, we look for as big exit as, as possible. I don't know how much Summit expects, but I suppose oh. it's going to be 3x plus. Or, uh. I mean, for someone like us, a 3x, a small startup, you could expect 10x, 100x. Exactly. Um, our, our dream is about 100x. Right. Right. Any investor who tells you 
Any investor who tells you they're in it for the long haul is lying to you. Well, remember, an IP, uh, if you do an IPO, um, your founders are actually locked up for a long, long time. And an IPO is maybe 25 percent. Uh, you know, half may be new issue, half may be existing shares being sold. And it takes you many, many years to, to get liquid in an IPO. So True. venture capitalists invest like uh, baseball. You know, familiar with baseball? So you either hit a home run or you strike out. They don't expect anything in between. It's, and they know that they're going to strike out probably 40% of the time. So in order to make up for the strikeouts, they need to have two or three home runs. And every one that they look for is going to try to be a home run. So okay. exactly right. But if your question was, uh, was also about whether you know, there's a possibility for the entrepreneur to buy us back when yeah, we invest. In that usually does not happen because in that case, the interests of the entrepreneur and investor would not be aligned anymore. And, and you know, this is a business of you know, partnership. We need to be partners in order to succeed big time. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Please join me in thanking our guests for a great job. Thank you. Thank you.